Hi, and welcome back as we move on to a new chapter and a new topic. And I want you to realize that it's super important for you to keep up. Every one hour lecture usually is a whole new chapter in the textbook. So make sure you're using that textbook and referencing it. If the text goes into more detail than what we cover, you don't need to know that extra detail. That detail is there to help explain stuff to you. Make sure you're going over your class notes, usually the same day as class, and review them again the next day. Do not ever put it off more than 48 hours. Like, for instance, on Thursday, don't let it sit until Sunday or Monday till you get over it. It's been too long and you will have forgotten, much less half the time you can't even understand what your notes were that you've written. Anatomy is visual, so it's really important that you draw pictures and you look at pictures and you cover up the tags and you practice labeling them. Um, I'll be talking um, later on about me methods to help you do that. And definitely don't shirk your lab. Studying in lab is going to help you with lecture and terms used in lab are also used in lecture and you're expected to know those terms as well. Um, it's it's very important that you take them both seriously. Okay, so one thing I want you to do is to review in the text, learn about tonicity, which has to do with osmosis, the movement of water down its concentration gradient. If the water concentration of the solution that we put a cell in, and yes, there's pictures of red blood cells here, just for example, if it's put in what we call an isotonic solution, that means the concentration of water inside the cell is the same as the concentration of water outside the cell. So water comes in the cell and goes out of the cell at the same rates. So the cell doesn't change its size or shape and the cell is very happy. If on the other hand, um, you put a cell into what's called a hypotonic, hypo meaning underneath. So there's less stuff dissolved in the solution, which means there's more water in the solution. There's extra water outside the cell. What that means is the water is going to try to enter the cell and try to make the concentrations the same. And as it enters the cell, then that cell gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And just like a balloon, eventually it will burst. So that is not a good thing. Now, the opposite of hypotonic would be to put it in a hypertonic solution where there's a lot more, say, for instance, salt dissolved in the solution, in which case then there's more water in the cell and the, and the water is going to leave the cell to try to dilute the solution outside the cell. And so the cell shrinks up and in this case, the cell can die too. So cells really like to be an isotonic solution and that's how they are in your body and then everything stays in that zen-like homeostasis. All right, let's move on to tissues. So what was a tissue when we talked about it in the anatomy basics? That's right. It was two or more cells working together for a common goal. Now here's the thing, your body only has four types of tissues, okay? Connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, epithelial tissue. Now granted, three of the four there are subtypes, but there's only four types. So anytime the question says name the tissue, you need to figure out which one of those four is your answer and write that first then worry about the subtype. But if you don't write epithelium, it doesn't matter if you give the subtype if you haven't given the word epithelium. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started about the four types of tissue. Uh, we're gonna get started. I'm doing them in the order that they're printed here, one, two, three, four, that's why they're numbered that way. We're gonna start with connective tissue. So let's learn the basics of all connective tissue. First off, there's going to be eight different types. And this is the most widespread type of connective tissue in your body. And all eight types of connective tissue have the same two basic components, cells and the stuff outside the cells known as the extracellular, meaning outside the cells, matrix. So when you look at this cartoon drawing here on the right, can you recognize the cells? 
That's right, they're the things with the nuclei in them. So there's four cells in this picture. So are there more of the cells or more of the other stuff? Well, there's more of the other stuff. And that's the way connective tissue is, okay? It has what we call a high matrix to cellular ratio. In other words, there's more of the other stuff than there are cells. And don't get confused. These blue things, even though they may be bigger than the cells, they're not cells. Okay? That's part of the other stuff, which we'll get back to shortly. All of this is the other stuff. There's only four cells in this drawing. Now, most types of connective tissue will have blood vessels and will have ner a nervous supply as well. If they do not, I will point it out. Otherwise, just assume everything has blood, so it gets nutrition, gets rid of waste, and everything has a nervous supply. So what are what is in the extracellular matrix? Remember, connective tissue made of cells, an extracellular matrix. An extracellular matrix is made out of protein fibers, which are embedded in this background material known as ground substance. So in this picture, we've got these little per purple protein fibers, we've got these blue protein fibers, and then all this brownish stuff, even with the little blobs, all of that is called the ground substance. So let's look at the extracellular matrix. Well, actually, let's look at the cells first. I thought I was doing extracellular matrix, but it's the cell slide that came up next. So when you look at this, there's a lot of words here that you don't know what they mean. So let's stop and talk some suffixes for a second. Anytime you see a word that ends with blast, what that tells you is this is a more immature cell that is actively producing whatever it is. For instance, a fibroblast, the root would be fibro, right here, as in fibers, is actively producing tons of fibers, protein fibers. In contrast to this, if the suffix is site, that means it's a more mature cell. It's not retired, but it's more mature. It's less actively secreting. So it's not building the house, it's just maintaining the house, it's sweeping the house, maybe it has to do some touch up paint, all that kind of stuff. So anytime you see a site like an osteocyte, that os is a prefix that means bone. So osteocyte would be a mature bone cell. And in contrast to that, if you see the suffix clasp, that means it's going to be destroying stuff. Now, looking up here, we have fibroblasts. I just explained them to you. Macrophages, what do you think a macrophage is? What does macro mean as opposed to micro? Macro means big, micro means small. And what did that phage word meant as in phagocytosis? It means to eat. So macrophage is a big eater. So here's an example of a macrophage which is a specialized type of what used to be a white blood cell, and its job is to go there and eat up debris, including, for instance, bacteria that don't belong there. Leukocytes, there's five different types. These are just white blood cells. You don't have to know them. We will come back and do um, the blood later on, and that's when you'll have to learn about them. An adipocyte, we're going to learn about shortly because that's a fat cell. Other cells, mast cells, plasma cells, other white blood cells like lymphocytes, um, plasma cells, neutrophils. When we get to the blood, we'll learn about them. Until then, you don't need to know anything about them. So let's talk for a moment about the fibroblast because it's a pretty awesome cell and deserves a little respect. In all eight types of connective tissue, it is by far the most common type because it produces all of the fibers, all of the protein fibers we're going to be talking about. In addition to fiber production, it produces most of the ground substance. 
So if you remember, the extracellular matrix was ground substance and protein fibers. So let's look at the ground substance first. This is what fills what are known as interstitial spaces. So inter means between. So interstitial spaces are all of those spaces between the cells. So yes, we used to use the word intercellular, but that was because cells were right next to each other. So we had this little intercellular space between the two. And yes, the intercellular space is also extracellular, yes. Um, but we don't use them. And so a third term, interstitial space, is really important because if you recall, connective tissue is mostly not cells. So it's going to be mostly extracellular or interstitial space. You're going to need to learn this word in addition to intercellular and extracellular, all meaning outside the cell. It is the ground substance changes that determine the different types of connective tissue because it determines how solid and liquid it is. So what's in ground substance? Well, there's a lot of water. Yes, there's a lot of salts. And then there's three types of large molecules, um, proteoglycans and things. You can read about them in your text. I thought I had a slide on them, but I don't. All right, moving on, connective tissue fibers, the other component of the ground substance. So let's stop for a second. How many types of tissue were there? Four. What's the first one? Connective tissue. What's all, what are the two things all connective tissues are made out of? Cells and extracellular matrix. What are the two components of extracellular matrix? Ground substance and protein fibers. That's where we are now. So make yourself a little flow chart and a little outline so you understand how this goes, a concept map if it was. So here's a picture of connective tissue and, and this picture actually contains all three types of fibers. So the first one, do you see these big pale pink things in the background? All right. That is the protein fiber known as collagen. It's the most abundant. It has a little bit of flexibility, but you can't stretch it, you'll break it. And in fact, collagen in your body, this is 25% of the protein in your body. And you thought all the protein in your body was going to your muscles. No, 25% of it is going to collagen. And this requires vitamin C to be formed. So yes, you can't just eat all that protein powder. You need to have your citrus fruits as well. This was the problem with exploring the world with the sailors dying of scurvy. They, their collagen would break down, all their protein would break down because they didn't have their vitamin C. But here's what I want you to get out of collagen. Every single time I say collagen, you need to be thinking strength. Okay. <coughs> so if I say a certain tissue is strong, then you're thinking, oh, those cells must contain, oh, sorry, not those cells. The that tissue must contain a lot of collagen in it. And that's all it would be. The second type, oh, okay. So here's where you go to your grocery store. And we've all had meat like this, right? That has all that tough, this is not the marbling. These are those tough white fibers. And if you try to cook this like steak on your barbecue, you're chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. And eventually you give up and you just swallow because you're forced to this you know, buy the cheap meat. Okay, that type of meat, you need to break down the collagen and the only way that's gonna happen is if you dump it in a stew or you braise it and you cook it in the oven for hours and hours and hours and that's how the collagen breaks down. It'd be very flavorful, but you can't cook it like a steak and expect to enjoy it. That's your collagen, giving it lots of strength. The second type of fiber are these dark, thick, black lines, and these are elastic fibers. So what does elastic fibers do? They contain elastin, which is a protein, and you go, what does it do? And you go, oh, it stretches. And I go, really? That's what you want your elastic and your underwear to do? Stretch? Don't you want it to come back in? We all have those underwear where the elastic's been stretched out and like, you know, they fall. So the whole point of the elastic fiber is not just the stretch, but the return to its resting length. 
So these are very abundant in your skin where you can stretch it. Blood vessels, when, heart, when the heart pumps blood out, the blood vessels close to the heart need to be able to expand to contain that blood, but then they need to go back to their resting diameter. And in your lungs, right? Take a deep breath, your lung expands, it's got to shrink back in because otherwise it just gets bigger, 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 and then your lungs are going to pop. Not a good thing. And then the third type of fiber are these skinny little tiny black lines, okay? And these are reticular fibers. And by themselves, they can't do anything, but their benefit is when you have tons of them because they form a network which fills spaces which makes it more solid because otherwise it would be like this mushy bag all right so all connected tissue comes from a substance before you were born called mesenchyme so here is our first slide on developmental anatomy this is what's formed in the embryo when you're, you know, still in your mother's uterus. From the mesenchyme, this is the embryonic connective tissue. It still has cells and it still has extracellular matrix containing ground substance and protein fibers. So it's got the definition of connective tissue. And this migrates everywhere in your body and gets chemical signals and changes into all of the adult connective tissue types. And any time of a cancer of a connective tissue is gonna be called a sarcoma. So when we are looking at connective tissue, it all comes from mesenchyme. And so there's another example of mesenchyme, a photomicrograph. And so we have eight different types of connective tissue. One of them is only found one place in the body, so we're gonna get that one until we get there, leaving us with seven. So these are the seven types, and you notice there are six pictures because there are six that are everywhere through your body, okay? So these are the ones we're going to talk about, and it's difficult for students to try to remember them Textbooks try to talk about like, well, there's connective tissue proper, and then I go, well, what are the rest of them rude? And then they talk about, well, there's loose connective tissue, and I go, I don't really care about that. I just want you to know the six types of connective tissue, and then the other two types when we talk about it. We are gonna talk about seven of them right away, um, but then we're gonna let the one sit on the back burner until we get back to it, because there's not very many places in your body. So for the six that we're going to be talking about a whole lot, basically I want you to think of it kind of like grades. We're going to have two A's, we're going to have two B's, we're going to have one C and one D. So the two A's are going to be a real or an adipose, the two B's are going to be bone and blood, the C is going to be cartilage, and D is going to be dense. Then we're going to have reticular connective tissue for the seventh one, which is not the one, not one here. So I've already told you all six what these are. At the end, when you've learned about all six, come back and figure out which picture of these is which one of these six. So I will see you again where we go through these seven types of connective tissue on the next video. Thank you and have a great